Good God, we are already now on part 20 within my vinyl collection series, and we're just about to reach the halfway point. And we're still only in the G still. But yeah, other than that, what's going to be playing in the background is going to be Obtained Enslavement, Witchcraft. All I'm going to say is this. One of the greatest symphonic black metal albums ever. And that's it. So let's get back on to showing some records. We kick off part 20 with a punk rock band, and that would be the one and only Gizm with their debut album, Detestation. Finally, 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 this has gotten a repress. Because for the longest time, it had a one and only time pressing. The first press goes for just dumb money that's nearly impossible to get. And over the past recent years, has issued out a lot of uh, bootlegs. But finally, there is a proper repress for this and snagged it up right away. And how I've always looked at uh, Detestation by Gizm is that at its core, it is a punk rock album. But it definitely appeals to a lot of metal fans, I feel like, because there's a lot of moments within this album that the riffs get really, like, thrashy, like, to the point of, like, borderline thrash metal. The guitar solos have more of, like, a heavy metal factor to it. And it just jams out so hard that it reminds me more of heavy metal compared to punk rock. Another thing I feel like I need to bring up with Gizm is that they were always considered the, the most dangerous punk band to see live. So I know a lot of people would argue that Gigi Allen was like the most dangerous because of all of his antics. That if you were to ever go to a show of his, uh, you know, he would go in the crowd and fight people. Um, he would always play naked, he would defecate on stage and then basically throw his feces and vomit at people and just basically do anything that he felt like was, you know, anti-authoritative or against the grain of what we consider to be a norm. That was basically Gigi Allen's thing. But Gizm's show antics are just ten times more extreme and you can find some of them on YouTube. From what I've seen and read online, is that obviously the guys from Gizm would start fights uh, with people in the crowd. I've also seen that they would bring flamethrowers and start blowing the torch around people at on stage. I've uh, read stories where they would bring in gu loaded guns and just start shooting them off while playing on stage. And another thing too that's the craziest I've seen is that one of the members uh, brought in a bulldozer and like knocked over like um, a wall and the venue had to shut down obviously that night. To me, Gizm's live antics were, you know, a narco punk as it would get basically. Like they were fucking insane, this band, if you ever um, search up some of their live footage. But yeah, to me, Gizm is the total package in terms of a narco punk. But anyway, other than that, um, this is a repress, as I stated, put out through Relapse. Pretty sure you can still get copies there. And uh, another thing, too, I need to bring up is with the layout and packaging, which a lot of people complained about, it's not that much of a big deal to me. Again, I'm just happy I own this. But um, as you can see here with the uh, artwork, I took it off. But originally, there was an Obi strip right here. And, you know, and I'm all for Obi strips, you know. It adds a little charm to an album in the packaging, but Relapse decided to tape it or you know even glue it on uh, to the to the jacket, which I think is insanely fucking stupid. So to all distros and labels that do that, uh, please fucking don't. That's just insanely dumb. But obviously they did that to block out <clears throat> this right here, which even though they blocked it out regardless, this circle originally in the first press um, has a swastika. I feel like they uh, did the Obi strip by gluing it on, that way it could block it out, even though they blocked it out regardless. And, I mean, I get the fact that, you know, it's a swastika, it's offensive, yada yada yada. But I feel like the concept uh, for the album artwork fits it. It's not meant in some type of, like, offensive way. Because you have the anarcho-punks on this side going against, like, all the authoritative you know, figures right here on this side. So it kind of, like, works with the whole uh, concept. But, you know, that's just really, really nitpick and really pointless shit. Again, 
I'm just happy that this exists finally. But anyway, as for the actual layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, and one thing I just want to point out is uh, one of the tracks is called There There Syphilitic Vaginas to Pieces, which the band Syphilitic Vaginas, one of my favorite black and speed metal bands, uh, got the name from from that track. Comes with an insert sheet with artwork and band picture on the other side. This LP pressing comes on white, limited to 2,000 copies exclusive to the online relapse store. Next up is the debut full length by Glemseal. Uh, really all this is is just really riff heavy black metal that is all about atmosphere. A bit melodic, but the selling point for me is that it's put out through Ben Detta Records. I checked out uh, one track uh, off this LP and was thoroughly impressed enough to blind buy it. And again, the fact that it's put through Vendetta Records was the big selling point, because I would say, as of right now, out of some of the best distros that specialize within black metal within their roster, Vendetta is definitely up there as one of the most reliable. That if you enjoy the style of it being atmospheric, a bit melodic, and very riff-heavy, a lot of the bands signed to Vendetta Records sound eerily similar to this. And, um, yeah, not disappointed by it. Nothing groundbreaking or something that you should just, you know, drop everything you're doing and checking out. But if you're a black metal fan looking for just riff-heavy black metal, this will definitely hit the spot. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging, you have Almar or Backside. Comes with an insert sheet with lyrics. And this LP pressing comes on brown. Ah, uh, boy. Finally, now I get to talk about this band within my vinyl collection series. So we're going to start it off with my collection of Gnaw Their Tongues. This is the recent vinyl pressing of the debut album by Gnaw Their Tongues, that being Spit At Me and Wreak Havoc On My Flesh. Oh boy. Gnaw Their Tongues has been a one-man black metal project, all done by Maurice and this is some of the most disturbing yet creative black metal you could come across within the genre. That it is just nightmare fuel, and I can't stress it enough, the first half of the discography by Another Tongues is equivalent to watching a snuff film. Like, it is just so <laughs> uncomfortable and just fucked up. Just the overall tone, atmosphere, and vibe of Another Tongues that it's just eesh. It's very, it's it's very nerve-wracking. It's definitely not meant for people who are new to black metal. If you're new to black metal, stay the fuck away from this. Sorry, I'll just leave it at that. And spit at me and wreak havoc on my flesh. This is where, man. Again, every record we're going to be talking about in other tongues is a bit different from the other and the previous, but it's just, again, all has that Nightmare Fuel vibe going off with it. But Spit At Me and Wreak Havoc on My Flesh has moments of, like, dark ambience and industrial. Black metal is used, but not, like, the majority of it. If anything, how I've noticed with Nother Tongues is that black metal is utilized, like, within, like, half of the formula. The other half is all the weird experimentations of all different styles of music from drone, dark ambience, and industrial just thrown at you to make it so uncomfortable to listen to. And I don't know, like, you know, you would think, like, I'm making this seem like it's a challenge to listen to Nother Tongues, but I feel like when you get so immersed with black metal and all the, you know, icy, cold atmosphere and it being just so inaccessible with its raw tone, to come across a band like Nother Tongues that really actually challenges you for a black metal fan, there's just something about it I find just so appealing and entertaining, as weird as I sound saying that, which has always been the thing that sold me about uh, this project right here. But yeah, I'm really happy to see though that this finally got an LP pressing because this was originally released in 2006, and I believe only a month ago, it recently got uh, a vinyl press for it, so snagged it up right away. But tracks on here to uh, check out, honestly, I don't even feel like there's a point in naming the tracks with Nother Tongues. It's, it's, 
No other Tongues albums are meant to be listened to from start to finish to truly get the vibe and just the overall experience with the band. This is not a band you skip over each track. Like, it's just, again, if you listen to No Other Tongues, you have to listen to the albums from start to finish. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. And that's just the best way to describe it. But anyway, for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, comes with an insert sheet, both sides with artwork, and this LP variant is a special edition on kind of like this white marble color, limited to 50 copies. I also have the pinnacle of the Nother Tongues discography, that it is one of the hardest albums to listen to. Never before has an album challenged me as hard as this album. And that would be what I consider the magnum opus for Nother Tongues. All the dread magnificence of perversity. Ooh, man, is this album just so fucked up. <laughs> like, oh my god. I, one way to describe this album is I've always said it's like the unofficial soundtrack to the dark web itself, basically. And another way of describing it too, because I cannot emphasize enough just how insanely just ugh, fucked up this album is, is this is equivalent to... In terms of just like the difficulty of listening to it, let's compare it to like film. And they say some of the hardest movies to watch that isn't like, you know, actual real life events, you know, just all acted out and, you know, post-production and shit like that. They say some of the hardest films to watch are 120 Days of Sodomy, Begotten, and uh, the Serbian film are some of the hardest films to watch. This is basically the musical equivalent of that, alright? I just, I need you guys to... If you decide to listen to this, be prepared for it, alright? And another thing too, I know it's labeled Black Metal. Which, yeah, there are certain moments within this album that goes on for like 70 minutes that you'll get Black Metal moments, but it's not like Black Metal in the sense of tremolo pick guitars, you know, and wretched screams, and you know, rhythm sections that you'd find in Black Metal. It's more like... Think of uh, Dark Metal by Bethlehem, but just on heroin, right, is one way to describe this, along with all the dark ambience and industrial and in drone that just smothers you to the point that you feel like you're suffocating just listening to it, all right? Like, I know I'm, I, it sounds like I'm overselling this album, but I can't emphasize it enough. It's one of the most fucked up things within the shelves of my records. And that's why I can't help but appraise it, that I feel this certain type of way and emotions when just talking about this thing. So, yeah, in terms of all the ways Nother Tongues tries to fuck you up mentally with its audio sound, this is the pinnacle of, like, the fucked upness, you know, that's not a word, fucked upness, but I, I feel like I have to start making up words and adjectives to describe this album. But anyway... As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside, comes on a gatefold, double LP that just come on standard black vinyl. I'm missing quite a bit of the discography of Nother Tongues, which is kind of understandable considering the fact that his discography is massive, and as well too, not, not everything has really been put on LPs, and it's recently starting to get represses here and there within his discography, so again, I'm missing quite a lot. But next up, I believe, is an album from 2011 uh, right here, which I don't know how to pronounce it, so I'll just show you right there. That's the name of this album. And I would say during the turn of the decade in the 2010s, this is when Maurice starts to add in more experimentation with Nother Tongues, and though it's still terrifying and has like that, you know, nightmare fuel type of sound, it's just a tad more accessible because the experimentation just has some types of melodies or something that isn't just so, like, torture-ish, I guess is a word we can use. It just doesn't feel like audio torture as much. And with this album, the experimentation on this, I've noticed, is that there's a lot of choirs 
uh, utilized uh, throughout this album and sampled through it that gives off like a very morbid classical vibe that kind of reminds me a bit, it's like as if we were to have like a black metal band form in like Victorian era uh, England, I guess is the best way to put this album. And it's really interesting, uh, nonetheless, by uh, No Other Tongues. I remember getting this um, at, I think, a vendor at the Maryland Death Fest a few years ago, and they're pretty easy to find, actually, because I know uh, people on Discogs, they're selling it for like 10, 12 bucks, so it's quite the steal of a price for an album like this. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside, comes on a gatefold, and this LP comes on gold. Proceeding onwards to hymns for the broken, swollen, and silent. This is a full length release by Nother Tongues, I believe around the time of 2016, that I would say out of everything I own by Nother Tongues, this is kind of like my least favorite. So I bought it uh, off of a uh, pre-order because I was pretty hyped for it. And it's experimental and avant-garde, I guess, you know, you can blend the two together, that really all it's doing is just being kind of weird with the time signatures, along with the fact, too, that I feel like it's Maurice trying to be like a Despel Omega uh, sound with no other tongues, which is interesting and showcases just how much he's willing to go and experiment with this album. But the keyboards and piano works utilized on this album just kind of get a bit sloppy and it just feels like a mess more than, you know, another Tongues album. So I wasn't really crazy for it all that much after spinning it on the turntable, but maybe I gotta give it a few more listens because it's honestly been quite a while since I spun this. But yeah, it's like more hyperactive of a take for another Tongues, which is maybe the real reason why I just find it odd because I just know him as being like the slow burner or drone dark ambience really takes center stage and this is just no other tongues more on the aggression while still being weird I guess is the best way to put this album but pretty sure you can still get this on the band camp for no other tongues so if you want to get it grab it there as for the layout and packaging you have album artwork, backside of the track listings, insert sheet with artwork love this because again it has like that Victorian era type of uh, imagery going on there. And this LP variant comes on white, limited to 100 copies. The last record I have by Nother Tongues is Genocidal Majesty. Hot damn, this album slays so hard. I know, as I stated earlier, I've always enjoyed Nother Tongues for the more slow burn take, but this is one instance right here with this full length where the faster, more aggressive side of Northern Tongues is really awesome because even though it still has all the dark ambience and noise and drone and industrial being thrown at you, it's just so hard on the offense that it's kind of like one of the very few albums I would consider to be like a very experimental take on like bestial black metal and this shit again just slays so hard. Tracks on here like Spirits Broken by Swords, the title track, and Ten Bodies Hanging will just obliterate your eardrum. And it's like probably the only time that I would consider Nother Tongues to be heavy and just, you know, aggressive. And it works for him. And hopefully, more records um, that come out by Nother Tongues. Because I know, again, Maurice releases music like on a monthly basis with like the other six projects he's active with. Hopefully sounds more like this because this shit rocks. Now, I would definitely say, as weird as this sounds, if you want to start getting into Nother Tongues, honestly, Genocidal Majesty is the best place to start out with because it just feels the most familiar for extreme metal fans, which is how bass heavy and aggressive it is. But again, make no mistake about it, it's still very experimental and abstract. It's very abrasive with the noises. It's, it's just. Again, if you're familiar with Northern Tongues, but you want the aggressive approach, again, can't stress it enough, Genocidal Majesty is the one to check out. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside, standard black vinyl, but comes with a printed inner sleeve right there, both sides with artwork. Up next is the self-titled release by Nipa Holland. I'm not quite sure if this is a demo comp or a demo or an EP. I know it's not the debut full length, 
But Nipa Holland is one of the many projects done by Swarty the Puth, who's the mastermind behind all the ancient record bands, that earlier in this series, around like maybe part four or five, I talked about as Alyssa Sap, which is my personal uh, favorite project that this guy's a part of. But Nipa Holland, for the most part, is a pretty solid project. This is really the only release off of a Nipa Holland I think is worthy of getting because it's just really straightforward, by the books, black metal that would be carrying the spirit, uh, so to say. So it's not really doing anything new or groundbreaking, and it's just more of those type of albums that if you're looking for more black metal to, you know, enjoy as a black metal fan, Nipa Holland will definitely uh, pique your interest, so to say. But yeah, it's just a black metal album doing black metal things, and uh, that's literally it. So anyway, as for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with all the track listings, the man right there, Swarty the Puth, and just comes on standard black vinyl. Up next is Gnome with the demo Silent Scream. Gnome was a black metal project from Japan, fronted by one member, I believe, uh, his name is... fuck... Matt... His name's escaping me right now, his actual name, but I know his stage name is Wood. And um, he also had another band, which is uh, Hurasami, which I cannot wait... Hurasama, I don't know why I said Sami. Hurasama, which I can't wait to talk about later on in this series. But Gnome, for the most part, I would say, if you enjoy Burzum, the first four albums, but you want a more progressive take on it where it isn't so, I guess, repetitive, relying on ambience, definitely check out Gnome because the similar traits are definitely there. And uh, yeah, really, other than that, there's not much to say as it's a demo that's only compiled of uh, five tracks and it roughly ranges around um, 20 minutes long. But pretty sure this is easy to get on Discog, surprisingly, as you can tell, since with the OB strip, it's the... Uh, go to Warwick's release, but this is still easy to get on Discogs. I've seen it float around for around the $20 range, and it's definitely worth getting. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listings. Comes with an insert sheet with artwork and notes on the other side. And this final pressing comes on a gray marble looking type of color. Once again, yes, finally now I get to talk about this band within the vinyl collection series. Next up is one of my personal favorite post-rock bands. That would be God is an Astronaut. This is their self-titled full length. God is an Astronaut, honestly, the first half of their discography, they did no wrong. To me, it's post-rock that has more of the jam out factor to it. It doesn't rely so much on build up and all just always trying to be pretty. Like there's moments of just like they just straight up jam out like a rock band should. And the usage of ambience and keyboards doesn't make it feel pretentious. It just always feels like uplifting and just livened up compared to most other post-rock bands that rely so much on dragging out songs. God is an Astronaut is one of the few post-rock bands that just straight out jam out from start to finish. Because our tracks on here like Postmortem, Echoes, which is a, a fan favorite on here, First Day of the Sun's another great track, and Remaining Light, really energetic, vibrant, colorful, but just overall, again, just has that jam out factor for post-rock that a lot of bands severely lack. That I remember catching them live, uh, I want to say it was around 2015 or 16, which was um, a really special event because it was the first time in like over half a decade they played within the States, and honestly, I never thought I'd see people headbang and mosh to a post-rock band, but God is an Astronaut made that happen. Also, another thing too that really broke my heart was this was around the time I saw them when I was with my ex-girlfriend during that time, and money was really tight for me. And I remember on their merch table, they had every single LP of theirs. And if I could, I would have bought them all but I only had enough money for one of them, and I got the self-titled uh, release right here because the other record I would love to own by them, but they didn't have it on the merch table. I think it's called uh, The Age of the Fifth Sun. That is another like near-perfect record by them that I strongly recommend checking out. But again, the first half of the discography of God is an Astronaut 
is all stellar. As for the layout and packaging of this record, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, along with the LP being on like this yellow greenish kind of looking color. Yes, 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 yes. Next up is one of my all time favorite albums in music itself. And one of the albums that really got me even interested with post rock to begin with. And that would be God is an Astronaut, All is Violent, All is Bright. <sighs> Everything about this record is just flawless. There is nothing about it that I can criticize in a negative way. The usage of post-rock and ambience is utilized in its fullest potential here, that it's just so fluid. It just flows together just so seamlessly that nothing drags out. The previous record I talked about where they still have the jam out moments that I praise them for, you'll still find it within it. But it just feels so much more surreal, even the jam out moments, because the ambience is just utilized just way more on here, but it doesn't overlap the rock segments. It's just, it's such a beautiful album. I, I, I love every little nanosecond of this album. Tracks on here like All Is Violent, All Is Bright, the title track, Forever Lost, Fireflies and Empty Skies, Suicide by Star is arguably one of the best songs they ever wrote that uh, I remember when I caught them live they played this song and uh, it was too good for words because when the uh, double bass pedal drums kick in it is just it's so real it is such a beautiful track that still has like that jam out factor to it and then you also have when everything dies dust and echoes remembrance day just again as I stated everything about this album is perfect as well, too, you're going to have guitars, bass, drums, keyboards, and synthesizers utilized within this album. But they also use vocals, and not vocals in terms of like cleaning up, uh, cleaning, singing, but in the term of like humming. And it just really adds to the harmonies and just, again, makes it very blissful sounding. Just every little tiny detail about this album, I love to pieces. And yeah, I, as you can tell, I consider this their magnum opus because after this album within their discography, they steadily start to dip down in quality because it's like now, present day God is an Astronaut, they don't really have like this weightless ambience and atmosphere going on like they did with this album. It, because it's weird, like they're so much more focused on the jam out segments that they're trying to come off more like a a metal band with like the post-rock uh, types of sounds because surprisingly they're assigned to uh, Napalm Records which I never thought they would be and their later stuff just doesn't resonate with me nearly as much as this right here so take it from me guys if you want the best by God as an Astronaut which a lot of people would agree with me with along with just one of the best post-rock albums I've ever heard all is violent, all is bright. I can't recommend it enough to listen to this album. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings, single LP, first press that comes on clear vinyl. Okay, so after talking about one of the greatest albums I believe ever made, next up is going to be Gojira with their fourth full length album, The Way of All Flesh. For me personally, this is my favorite album by them, which might be a hot take because for a lot of people, the fan favorite is their third full length, that being From Mars to Cyrus, or From Mars to Cirrus, I don't know why I always say Cyrus, but as much as I enjoy that album for what it is, blending both you know, progressive metal and groove metal in a very heavy, executed way, this album, I feel like they take that writing approach, but expand upon it more and add in way more experimentation, that it's just always fascinated me more, this album. Along with the fact, too, in high school, I remember playing this album on a daily basis because it's the song uh, Esoteric Surgery. <sighs> that guitar riff I adore the living hell out of. And I remember when I caught them live because they opened up for Slayer, which by the way, they blew away Slayer in the live performance. These guys kill it live. They played that song and it made me just oh so happy. 
Other great tracks on here are Toxic Garbage Island, A Sight to Behold, which is a really interesting track. They use uh, synthesizers, and they have like this auto-tune effect on their vocals that is really interesting. And again, adds to the experimental take with this album. Um, All the Tears, Adoration for None, which I believe has um, Randy Blythe um, from Lamb of God as a guest spot vocalist on there. The Art of Dying, which is a really interesting and really meticulous track on the time signatures that still feels, you know, aggressive and engaging. And Wolf Down the Earth, just this album, I just love every second of it. And I've always been a fan of Gojira just solely off of this album. And speaking of which, I really need to check out some of their later stuff because the recent album that was released about a month ago, I've heard a lot of good things about. So the next time I'm in a record store, I definitely need to expand upon my uh, Gojira uh, collection within the uh, vinyl shelves. But one other thing I want to bring up with this that not many people bring up with Gojira is that all four members for Gojira have always been consistent with the band. Because think of any metal band you can think of that you know has more than three members that isn't a duo and it's not a solo project that has you know three or four members it's considered a band that's been active for over a decade look up any one and you'll notice that there's former members live performance members you know special guest spots this and that that you know come and go Gojira is the only band that I that I've come across that all four members have been consistent. They've never left. It's always just been the four same dudes. And I think that's what kind of adds to their success is that you have the same minds always working together for over 20 years. And that's just something I find really intriguing about Gojira is that all four members have always stayed within this band, which is pretty neat. But uh, yeah, anyway, other than that, for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with track listings. This is actually a first press put out through uh, Poo Poo Records, I mean, uh, uh, Prosthetic Records. Comes on a gatefold. Double LP, both on standard black vinyl, but does come with an insert sheet with lyrics that folds out with even more lyrics. Reaching the end point within this part, next up is going to be Grand Blau's Key, Mocking the Philanthropist. This is the recent repress from uh, Sinistari Records, and uh, yeah, when it comes to USBM, United States Black Metal, more than likely Grand Belial's Key will usually be brought up because they're one of the first uh, black metal bands from the States. I, I would argue that the first wave, if you even want to get this technical, of US uh, black metal would be stuff like Vaughn, Profanatica, Judas Iscariot, and Grand Belial's Key kind of fits within that uh, wave, I guess, for USBM. And yeah, it's just really good, straightforward, uh, riff-heavy black metal. That Their standout feature for them that a lot of people are praising them for is that they have more of similar traits that you would find with traditional heavy metal, just, you know, fueled with the aggression and velocity of black metal. It's basically what uh, Grand Belial's Key did with uh, their first three full lengths. But uh, yeah, other than that, a lot of you guys should know who these guys are. If you do, you do. So for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside with the track listings. Comes on a gatefold with lyrics and band pictures. And this LP pressing comes on gold, limited to, I believe, either 300 or 500 copies. Second to last of this vinyl collection part is going to be Grand Belial's Key with the fan favorite, that being Judo Beast Assassination. Yep, you've probably seen a lot of people who are into black metal talk highly of this album. And yeah, I know I'm gonna come off like the cliche, you know, fan that talks about this album, but these riffs are insanely infectious. There's no denying it. And I think one thing that really amplifies that for a lot of people is yes, as I stated with the previous album, it has a lot of influence off of traditional heavy metal, but I believe somewhere in some interview you can find online, the guitarist for Grand Belial's Key made it abundantly clear that he was heavily influenced by bands like Running Wild. And basically how I look at Grand Belial's Key is that they are 
the black metal version of Running Wild, and I think that's why so many people find such fascination with the riffs of just how infectious they are. Because Running Wild, if you just want ass-kicking heavy metal riffs, Running Wild is like top of the line, cream of the crop for you know just riffs when it comes to uh, metal. But uh, yeah, other than that, I know a lot of people would say at this point that Grand Belial's Key is like one of the absolute very best within USBM. And while I do enjoy them, and I think they are actually really good and deserve a lot of the praise that they get, for me personally, I think the crown for like best USBM goes for either Negative Plane or uh, Judas Iscariot. I think those two kind of deserve it a bit more. But either way, you've heard so many people and countless people actually talk highly of uh, Grand Belial's Key. So it's not like really my say makes really any difference. But anyway, as for the layout and packaging, this is a 2019 repress through Drakkar. Not sure if it's still available, but if you want it, I'm pretty sure Drakkar still carries copies. But other than that, you have the album artwork, backside with the track listings, insert sheet with lyrics along with band picture, and everyone points it out, but I will too. The guitarist is wearing a soccer jersey, because ha ha ha, funny, instead of wearing a band shirt, he's wearing a soccer jersey. I'm, I don't know why people make such a big deal about that. And this LP variant comes on gold, limited to 500 copies. And the last record for this vinyl collection part will be Gridlink with their latest album, Long Enna. Gridlink was a technical grindcore band that had members from Discordance Axis. And this band is essentially the same thing as Discordance Axis, only the technicality feels a bit more melodic and not as rough around the edges as you would get with uh, Discordance Axis. Like, it's eerily the same thing, only it's just a bit more technical, I guess. And I know uh, John Chang, who is the vocalist here, just goes absolute ape shit like always with anything he's a part of with this. Because I remember discovering this before I discovered uh, Discordance Axis, and I was just in complete awe. Like, I didn't know you could make grindcore like this. Because usually when I think of grindcore, I think of bands that are just so focused on playing as blistering fast as possible that guitar riffs are kind of meaningless other than just making noise. And really, the only standout features about grindcore, for the most part, is the drumming and the vocals. The guitars have always just been, like, a component that just adds noise, for the most part. And to hear something like this, where the guitars are just so technical and flashy, it's like, I, just, I never thought grindcore could be done like this, and it blew me away at first listen. Because tracks on here like Constant Autumn, the opening track, which is amazing, Stay Without Me, and uh, Chalk Maple are incredible tracks. I know they all range around a minute and a half, 30 seconds, but they just are such loaded with energy, and it's incredible. And uh, other than that, I know this is the last record they ever did with this band, because after this... Uh, John Chang and company started another band that actually released an album, I believe, either 2019 or last year, called uh, No One Knows What The Dead Thinks, and it's just a continuation, basically, of Gridling. But anyway, other than that, pretty sure you can still get this easily on Discogs. I remember getting this copy for, like, 15 bucks on Discogs, so definitely check there. As for the layout and packaging, you have album artwork, backside of the track listings, and again the picture of this girl. Standard black vinyl, but does come with a booklet with all lyrics inside. And from what I gather, like always with anything that has to do with uh, John Chang and company, lyrics are probably about either anime or some type of like esoteric video game. All right, that'll do it for this vinyl collection part. Like always, guys, links will be provided to everything I talked about in the description below. And that is that. So like always, guys, make sure you guys drink plenty of water to stay hydrated and have a great day.